Good morning and welcome back to all of you who've uh, been at some of our previous sessions and welcome to all of you who are here for the first time. My name is Dan Nolan. Uh, I'm the president of Hugh Johnson Advisors and now the co-president of J&B Advisors. We're a financial planning, a multifamily office, and an asset management firm headquartered here in Albany, New York. I'd like to thank our partner in these sessions, the Times Union. You'll be hearing from the editor of the Times Union shortly. Uh, and welcome to what we believe will be a very lively panel discussion today on retooling your business. Uh, as I've started all of these sessions, we're in uncharted territory. Uh, there's no playbook for restarting the economy. There's no playbook for restarting our businesses. And we conceived of these discussions as a way not to provide answers to every challenge, but as a way to have a discussion uh, with the community about challenges we believe we'll see and share perhaps some solutions. Um, we hope that today you'll, uh, you'll find this session useful. Um, I would like to turn this over to uh, Hugh Johnson uh, my partner, who's the chief investment officer and the chairman of Hugh Johnson Advisors, to talk a little bit about the economy and what we see ahead. It is an ever-changing landscape, uh, and Hugh has some hopefully words of wisdom for us this morning. Hugh? Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, it, it's, uh, it is uh, great uh, to be uh, in partnership with the Times Union. certainly appreciate that on behalf of everybody at Hugh Johnson Advisors. Thank you, Dan, for the great introduction. And thank you for the panelists who you'll soon hear from and all of you that have joined the, uh, have joined the session, uh, who have logged on and have joined the session. Look forward to some really interesting questions, answers, and some things that might be helpful to those of you in the community that are working on uh, this so-called whole process of reopening. Uh, my my uh, role in this entire uh, uh, process is to try to give you a little bit of an idea of the just general setting, a setting for the national economy, the state economy, as well as the Albany economy, where we are and where we might be headed, sort of the background for in, within which we, we're going to be uh, operating. Uh, some of you have heard me speak before, know me, know me as a, a, a student of uh, cycles. Uh, there have been uh, 11 cycles in the post-war period. Uh, each cycle is very interesting. Each cycle is different consists of a stock market cycle, which is accompanied by or followed by a business cycle, which is followed by an interest rate cycle. So you have uh, a bull market that's uh, accompanied by an economic recovery or expansion. And then you get the start of a bear market, which is accompanied by a recession. And of course, where we are now is that we're in a bear market and it's gonna be accompanied by a recession. A lot of people ask me about the performance of the markets, the stock market, particularly now that uh, we're in the depths of a, a recession where economic news is pretty miserable or gloomy. Uh, and I'll try to get to that. Uh, but the more I look at the uh, performance of the stock market, uh, the financial markets in general, the more I'm sort of convinced or become uh, of the mind that uh, this might very well be uh, that we're seeing the start of the so-called uh, bull market that will be accompanied by an economic expansion. Let me explain that. In the When I look at the financial markets, I see uh, since the, the, the March low that the stock market is up 35%. That's a lot. I see that investors slowly but surely are sort of migrating to the so-called bull market or economically sensitive sectors in the market. Things like technology, consumer discretionary, basic materials, Investors don't buy those sectors of the market unless they're becoming increasingly more uh, positive or optimistic about prospects for the economy, importantly, earnings. And also quality spreads in the credit markets, the difference of the, between the yield on a junk bond and the yield on a treasury, that's narrowed a lot. Investors willing to accept a lower yield on junk bonds, they'll only do that unless uh, when they become a little bit more optimistic about prospects for the economy. So we're seeing some positive signs from the markets. And you know, the interesting things is I think those, th those signs from the markets are fairly rational. I think they're consistent with what I take to be a fairly rational forecast for what lies ahead. And that's important to investors, not where we are, but where we're going, uh, but what lies ahead for the uh, economy and, and earnings. Uh, you know, we're in a recession. The recession started in the first quarter, more specifically in the month of March, and it continued in the month of April. You saw that notably in those employment numbers. It was hard to imagine employment numbers as bad as those. 
We lost 20.5 million jobs during the month of April and the unemployment rate increased from 4.4% to 14.7%. You know, since we saw those numbers, the look at jobless claims, first time claims for unemployment insurance, they've gotten up to 36 million. That tells me that that 20.5 million uh, job loss that we saw in the month of April is not big enough. It's gonna be revised upwards as will the unemployment rate itself. So bad news in March, bad news in April. But I think, I think what we're gonna see, and I, I feel pretty good about this forecast, we're gonna to start to see positive numbers as we look at the May numbers and the June numbers. They're not gonna be as good as I said last week, but they'll still be, I think, on the positive side. What does that mean? It means employment numbers. We'll add 1.5 million jobs in May, and you'll see that with the May employment report we'll add something in the order of 2.5 million jobs in the month of June, and so on, so on and so forth as we work through the rest of 2020. So 2020 third quarter, we're likely to have a very big positive number, something like 12% growth in the economy. And that's a little bit better than I said last week, something like 9% in the fourth quarter. So we're gonna have be on a, a positive trend line as we move beyond April through the rest of the second quarter and the third and the fourth quarter, despite that fact. Although those numbers are gonna be improving, uh, the numbers for the year are not gonna be particularly good. We're gonna lose, let's say the economy contracted 5.8%. Uh, that's the fifth worst performance of the US economy in our history. But we're gonna be on a positive trend line. The same thing's gonna occur, I think, in 2021, 2022. We're looking at 4% growth in 2021, 3% growth in 2022. All of this is really good news. And it really kind of says to me that the stock market is performing well and it's performing well because investors see exactly what I'm talking about. They see that the economy is gonna be on a positive trend through the remainder of 2020 and 2021 and 2022. We're not gonna get back to the same levels of output and employment uh, that we saw at the end of 2019. We're not gonna do that until we get to the later part of 2021 and later part of 2022. But the most important thing right now for businesses and for investors is to recognize that the trend might be positive. There's risk, you know there's risk. And the big risk of course is the so-called second wave that we don't get the timing of this right. I'm very happy to say and I think New York State is being led by some very capable leaders that are paying attention to their healthcare professionals and are trying to put us on a path which is sensible. In other words, a path where we don't run that risk of that second wave. That's the big risk to all of us as investors. What do you do as an investor? I've given you sort of a positive view or positive outlook, particularly when we're looking at better earnings in 2021. Don't bet the ranch because there's still a lot of risk in this. What I'm saying is, you know, we have investors that have a 50% target for their equities in their portfolio. They give us room both upside and downside. Be around that 50% mark, but also maybe start to add a couple of stocks that might work well in the next bull market. So I'm on the, let's say, the positive side of a very neutral position, but I say don't bet the ranch because there's still big risk. Okay, that's pretty much what I think we're looking at. We're looking at a positive environment. Investors see that, that's why you see the market doing a little bit better. But keep in mind when I say there's, there, there's this element of risk. I look forward to the rest of this session. A lot of good questions, a great group of panelists to try to help us all do well as we reopen the economy in a staggered start. Thank you, Hugh, appreciate it. Um, interesting times in the economy and in the markets. And as you say, we'll wait and see what happens. So let me hand off to Casey Seiler, who is the editor of the Times Union, who will introduce our panelists and get our program started today. Casey. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks as well to Hugh. It's a reminder that when you are uh, when you're getting bad news, whether it's of a financial nature or uh, or medical tests, it's good to get it from somebody who speaks from deep knowledge and and speaks in a calm and clear voice. So, I too would like to thank the audience for uh, all of these events. This is, as Dan noted, our our fourth of these so far. I'd like to note that if you signed up on Eventbrite for this, you, uh, please be on the lookout for a survey 
that will ask you about how um, you enjoyed it or perhaps didn't enjoy it, what was missing and how we could improve future uh, sessions, which, um, which we think we'll, we'll probably be doing as, uh, as, as the uh, situation requires. I'd also like to invite people, whatever uh, platform you're watching this on, please post questions because we will have time um, in the, uh, the last quarter or so of this hour long session uh, to present those to our panel as well. Um, and with that, I would now turn to uh, introducing our outstanding panel. It includes Sunjata Chowdhury, founder and CEO of Tangible Development, a Latham based company that offers diversity and inclusion training and communication services to companies all over the world. Don Abul, co-founder and president of Repeat Business Systems Incorporated with offices in Albany, Syracuse and Oneida County. Uh, Dawn is also a practicing state licensed psychologist who earned her doctorate degree at UAlbany. Uh, being uh, somebody in business who is also a psychologist is of course uh, a pretty good combo of talents to have in these difficult days. And last but not least, Nicole Snow, founder and CEO of Darn Good Yarn, a half moon based business that employs more than 600 artisans around the world. The company has appeared for the last three years uh, on the Inc. 5000 list and was recently named New York's Capital Region Company to Watch. So thanks to, uh, to all those great panelists for taking part. I would like to invite Dan as well to, to jump into the conversation as you see fit. So, and now let's, uh, let's turn to our first topic. Uh, this session is about remaking your business. Of course, the prospect of a sort of top to bottom overhaul of your operation can seem daunting in times that are exhausting and anxious, as we all know. So here's sort of the, the existential question here. Why does that kind of change have to be seriously considered now perhaps more than ever? And I guess I would pitch that um, uh, to start off to, to Dawn, but um, anybody on the panel should feel free to jump in. Hi, everybody, and um, thank you for having me. When this first happened, I was like a lioness and her cubs. I wanted to protect my team, protect our customers. Um, I didn't even think of myself or being scared. So I was just into motion um, immediately. So the first thing we did is get everybody home. And that was obviously a technology um, uh, win, I guess, to get everybody home and safe. But um, I also realized that the emotional well-being of my staff was a really critical issue. So even the strongest person, the toughest person was scared to death. I had people crying um, almost within 24 hours. People were scared of getting sick. They were scared of losing their jobs. They were scared of the world changing so fast. So I had to do two things that really reduced their fear and kind of increased hope. For me, action is the best antidote to fear. So everyone had a task. They immediately had to tell me what we can do to accelerate our growth when the world went back to normal. It had everyone focused on the future and it had everyone able to contribute something that was meaningful and that was helpful. So everyone had to have an idea. Now we sell copy machines and IT services. So you can imagine the copy machines was done. Nobody was making any copies. Nobody was even in their offices. Our IT department was booming. People were working from home. They were concerned with security. And so we had to kind of pivot a little bit um, more to that. But people gave us amazing ideas, things that were nagging at us for a long time, like changing some of our forms that really weren't efficient, looking at completely different but complementary product lines. So I just want to say pivoting in the wrong direction is very bad. I heard today that Chuck E. Cheese was having some struggles, so they decided to um, sell pizza online, but they changed their name to Pasquale's Pizza. So if you order pizza from Pasquale's Pizza and you get a Chuck E. Cheese pizza, you're not very happy. So they're, they really tanked from that bad decision. So uh, obviously you have to be careful of how you're going to pivot. I feel like I am starting my 33 year old company all over again. We had to change our marketing strategy. Um, you mentioned critical, how time was critical. It is to us because every day we see our sales of our core business going down. So every day that we wait, we can't go back and recapture 
you know, what, what happened in the past. So we are, you know, constantly trying to figure out what new product line, what new forms we need, how we're going to market. Everybody's marketing more social, you know, with social media, online marketing, webinars. Um, there was just so much to learn as well as all the, you know, new programs that are out and we'll talk about what resources are available as well. So I'm trying to learn all these new things, kind of start from scratch, keep my team comfortable and happy and motivated. So the second thing I did was really in, make sure that I was communicating all the time, every morning at 8.45. And I just want everyone to know, I've skipped that just for all you guys today. I talk to my leadership team, give them an update. We talk about what we see that day and what we, you know, how we see things are going. But at four o'clock, I have 90 people on a call. Everybody in the company, it's mandatory every single day. And the first few days were just, this is where we are. We're going to be okay. And you see the communication shifting to, um, you know, are we laying people off? Are we not? Are we bringing people back? Are we applying for the loan? What products now are we service? You know, are we selling? What training does everyone need? I mean, there was just every day, there was some big change of, a, of how we had to communicate and what we had to talk about. But the communication really helped um, calm people down. People felt like they knew what was going on. I used to first ask people to post questions before the meeting at before four o'clock. And I was getting 20, 30 questions every day. And now I get almost no questions. And it's just, you can see that people's anxiety has really reduced. So, you know, as a, um, you know, as a psychologist, of course, that was my go-to and it was it really served me well. And people now feel like they know what we're doing. We have a new direction. It may not be perfect. It's going to be bumpy, but um, we feel like we can kind of get there. So, so we're hanging on and hopefully we're going to be, you know, better and stronger than ever. And, and that's my optimistic side. I mean, it has been pretty awful, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. But, um, you know, hope is everything. And uh, I definitely have a lot of that. Don, Don, I, should, I should have had you come there? into into my business because I had a very different, um, it was sort of like, okay, everyone get all of your stuff. And I remember um, I was not as poised. I said, like, this is the real deal. I need you to pack up your office as if we're not gonna see each other for another 30 days. And they thought it was Nicole being like typical nutty a little bit and um, well, a lot of it. And <laughs> I said, pack up your office. And like, it was, we literally, it looked like people were moving out of their college dorms and packing up their cars. And it was the weirdest. I mean, we have a much smaller team than you, but on the spot, what we did, um, I said, okay, like if this becomes an issue, like I have warehouse workers and we have to actually close our warehouse down because like there was a, about a week's worth of time. I remember it was like, I felt like we were free falling and I was like trying to take in every single news bit of news and we weren't getting government guidance. And it was like, okay, I need to start making decisions for us and getting into that idea of like, we're self-reliant. Like we are now a team, darn good yarn. And I said, okay, my warehouse workers, they're not going to be able to have hours. Like this is before PPP and like a lot of these other um, programs. So like on the fly, I said, grab inventory, write it down on a little piece of paper, give it to my ops manager so we know what's in and out of inventory, take that home with you. So if we have to do flash sales, and we were trying to get really innovative of other ways that we've reached out to our customers in the past in terms of selling, since we're direct to consumer, um, we just like really tried to throw everything at it. And I think that that kind of like nutty, and it was like a mama bear response, like get your stuff, you're going to sell at home. We're going to figure this out. And then that's, um, I think I scared the crap out of some people, but it had to be done so quickly because we wound up, um, we had, we like, we like our business stripped out. We were already moving from, we started the year off. I had a valuation done on the company and the main goal coming out of that was to say, okay, we're going to create efficiencies. So I think a lot of businesses have experienced quite a bit, of, a nice bit of growth over the last couple of years. And in that you do always get fat. So we were already going through luckily. Um, but I tell any business in this case, like we were already starting to trim fat and look at every single way this expense is going into our PL and it's flowing into our balance sheet and creating narratives on what that looks like. And that has been, um, that practice has been really important to us saying, okay, like, what are we, like, what is Darn Good Yarn really, really good at? Like, should we be doing our own dev? Mm, maybe not. And should we be doing this? And so now we're starting to say, okay, 
figuring out what our highest and best use is as a company and our business processes, and then figuring out how to build on that and having a very small team to do so. We, I went from 21 employees to nine employees. I'm at nine employees right now as a company. Um, so 21 employees at the beginning of the year. Um, so, I, you know, Casey, we were talking about this. I'd rather have a SEAL team than a army when going into something like this of people I can really trust mm. that I don't have to check in. And, you know, I know that you're just like working for the business at that point. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's, a why do we have to do this? It's survival really. Yeah. And I, I think tangible development, what we do is we're a diversity, equity, inclusion, consulting, and training company, but we work with companies on organizational change, efficiency, crisis management. Um, and it was interesting because we were for the first time thrown into being finding a solution for ourselves as well as finding solutions for other organizations. So for me, you know, honestly, I mean, my heart stopped because I was laying there and I have a team of four, we hustle. I mean, we hustle when one person's missing. I mean, you feel it, the domino effect because that's 25% of your team, right? But it was interesting because during this entire piece, one of my team members who is a pivotal, uh, our inclusion strategist does a lot of our strategy development, actually had just gone to Florida because was graduating with her PhD. And on top of that, um, uh, was going to move their family here with two little children from Florida to here. And all of a sudden, all the borders closed down. Graduation wasn't going to happen for this person after culmination of years and years of research. And it was emotional roller coaster. And at the same time, our clients were saying to us, come in and help us, we're in crisis. So we were going through a crisis as well as our clients were going through crises. And it was, um, for me personally, laying very similar to what both of you said, right? Laying awake at night, knowing that you're responsible for people's paychecks, the food that they bring home, the welfare of their families, their health care. I mean, it was, it was heart palpitations at first, thinking, how do we survive? And then it was pivoting realizing that what our clients needed is exactly what we needed. Yeah. And so how do we take what we were teaching and showing our clients on organizational change and, and crisis management and leaning out your business and efficiencies, how do we take that and we actually step back and be introspective about it, right? And as we were being introspective about it, we were also helping our clients. It was an interesting sort of way of, of doing business. And we've also pivoted in our offerings, in the way we do trainings, um, in the way we uh, do breakout sessions and we get people involved and engaged. And it's been, it's, it's been um, frightening to say the least, and I'm sure it has for Capital Region or any business, but um, uh, it's, been a learning, it's been a learning survival thing. And I think that what happens is you come together in crises, right? When at times you felt like there were barriers and silos in your teams or you weren't communicating or there were, there were issues, all of a sudden everybody's focus is on one. And, and then you start to think, okay, I need to keep my job. How can I help this company stay afloat? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, it's like this crisis brings you together in a way nothing else does. And um, um, it's a Super Bowl of business, really. So, you know, it's like so if you were... Together. If, um, if my organization has acknowledged the need to kind of make this sort of transformational change, what are the resources that companies can tap into to assist or in, in that type of work? Certainly, you know, tangible development is one of the many sort of consulting firms out there who, of course, would be, you know, happy to help in that endeavor. Um, uh, you know, should companies turn to their attorneys, their accountants, who else? And I guess I would, I would sort of pitch that to, uh, to Nicole to start off. Yeah, and I just wanted to say too that like um, Sujata, you said something really interesting, and I think like anyone who, who's operating and looking for like, okay, what can I take from this right now? Like looking at your customers. So I remember talking to someone who works in my warehouse, and I said, okay, you're in charge of social media, and you're now our cruise director on the Titanic. Like I don't know where we're going, but you need to like be cool with our customers, and it's not we're not going to try selling. Like we're just here to have fun at this point because I don't know what the hell is happening. And you don't, like no one does. And I thought that it was, we watched our engagement increase. I mean, not necessarily our sales, but it's such an opportunity to have really deep, interesting conversations with your customer base when, especially like for us, like we've been in this high growth mm -hmm. mode. So it's a nice place to actually have space to pump the brakes. But Casey, to your question, um, I got very lucky. I found a, a awesome CFO locally um, and I almost don't want to say her name because then everyone's going to use her. But um, <laughs> maybe if you reach out to me, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe share the resources. But 
having a CFO who knows how to work with banks. Um, and I think at like our level for a business, like we're just under 10 million in revenue and we're kind of in that place where, and I, and I talked to other business owners who were like, I have my accountant and like, they're not doing this. And I'm like, but you actually need a bookkeeper. And then that then turns into a CFO position. And that's been critical because you do have to look at it as a numbers game right now. Like what can we be trimming to make sure that we're here for another day? And uh, my banker, Roberta said it so well. I mean, it's, it's easy, but she's like, this is survival of the fittest. So it's old school business tactics and, um, and working on, okay, if your top line isn't growing, what are you doing within that PL to make sure that you're staying profitable so that you are paying for, for, you know, all of your retirement programs and benefits programs. Um, and then I think going back to HR, like we, I, I had, I engaged my office manager on these more like our morning, morning meetings as well to be our accountability point person, because it's, people were working in silos naturally. Um, and I said, no more silos. Like if you're not in embracing this interdisciplinary mindset, like my graphic designer, you need to understand what the marketing, like whatever marketing we're doing and that needs to mesh together. It can't just be make a graphic anymore and then have someone like revise it a little bit. So I think it's been a little bit of an HR play and engaging and my office manager has a um, very deep HR um, experience, but engaging that CFO and your banking team as well, um, their, their ear is closest to the ground in terms of access to capital and what their perception of the market is as well, which I think is important is if you do have opportunities to grow, like Hugh said it great, like don't bet the farm, but still have a level, level of optimism. Like I'm still looking to make sure that I have capital lines open to me um, if we're like, if we do experience a pop and India, for example, opens back up, which is most of my supply chain, it's shut down right now. Um, so that we can buy inventory and get ready for the holidays. You know, you know what's interesting is all three of you talked about the initial reactions were instinct mm -hmm. because you're hit by the tsunami and there's no mm -hmm. time to plan. And so you go to your instinct, but there had to be a time when you went from instinct to a more relaxed and calculated planning uh, regimen, right? And so I, I'm curious as to how that happened. Did you force that to happen? Was that natural? And, and even more importantly, how are you making decisions now for change? Is it you? Is it the entire company? Is it a group of senior people? How did it transition from instinct to planning? You know, so, you I know, don't think, you, uh, sorry, Dawn, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say that having a good CFO is everything. It changed all of our reporting. Every single day, I know where our cash is, where our sales are. I actually have a line that shows me if we go below that line, we can't afford our expenses. Mm -hmm. um, so our reporting is tighter than ever. I know more about my company now than I ever, ever did. And we're going to be able to keep this going forward. We have like a trajectory of um, our, you know, where our growth line mm -hmm. is and if we're falling off. We know We almost know to the penny what we need every day. But I think to the conversation of listening to your customers and, and both of you said the same thing, all of a sudden our customers needed IT security because they were working from home and all their home networks are all vulnerable. So all of a sudden we actually have to hire more IT people to address the home IT security needs and that we needed different forms, we needed different offerings. So um, we're just, but you're right. You have to, I think financially, you have to know where you are and be really solid. I would think there's, there's no company, no matter what size you are, that wouldn't benefit from that more than anything. You and then I think, it, sorry, John, I think and, it, it, it depends on the type of leader you are as well. Like I tend to go from my gut because I'm taking in so much information. Like I have, I was joking with everyone before the call, like I have multiple screens. It's just all the time. And so I think there's a lot of processing happening subconsciously. So I have to rely on my numbers people to really do their mm -hmm. job well. So I can still operate like my position of strength and the kind of leader I am is very much from my gut. And I used to try to shut that down and try to be more like analytical mm -hmm. um, where I'm more working in um, in harmony with with my financial people and, and working with my ops manager and say, you know what, Nicole, this isn't feasible um, and stepping out more, getting into that, that visionary position. And that's been a, a big change for us. But Nicole, is there an actual, do you, do you have planning sessions with your people or does it all come from you? No, I have planning sessions like with my C-suite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Jada, did you have something to add on that? 
No, and I was going to say, you know, from a resource standpoint, and this is great, you know, I don't have a CFO. I'm a party of four, right? So I don't have one. So, you know, you have businesses, even though we do a great deal of business and our business is actually increasing now. Um, And I was shocked because, you know, our, our existing clients went into a pause of service because they went into panic mode, not realizing that maybe we were actually going to be able to help them because they went into panic mode, right? So everybody just kind of stopped all business. Um, but the clients that step back and like you said, became more strategic and went into that relaxed mode, then realized, okay, we could use somebody with expertise. Now in our situation, we're a party of four and we're people of four, right? So we had to figure out our dollars, our finances. I was mm-hmm. doing the banking, I was doing the financing, I was the CFO, the COO, the, you know, and then I've got my team coming in and whoever had strengths and and strategic pivot pivoting of creating new products. I had them all in on that. I had somebody else doing all our social media, but then what we realized is, and then I stepped back and I said, okay, breathe. We're all just right now we're chasing versus leading. Right. And so you go from that panic to, to leading and how do you lead calmly? And then we realized, okay, what are some resources for small businesses? Cause look, capital region, we've got businesses that are, you know, 3,800 employees, like a global foundries to a business that might be a business of two to a business of 10 to a business of uh, 90 to 15. So what kind of resources and what can we do as businesses to survive, right? And for us, it became partnering with um, strategic partnerships we developed. We developed strategic partnerships with NYSID. We developed strategic partnerships with CEG and certain chambers. And and um, as we started doing that, we realized that we were, we were all going to do the same sort of work in that we are supporting businesses in the capital region. And and how do we do that together and put our resources together? So we recently just partnered with NYSIT and they're doing all our social media, but that works to our our, uh, mission and vision because we believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion. What better but better vendor supplier to have than to have somebody that is employing people with disabilities, right? And so they're doing our social media for us. We're doing all their member training for them. So it's sort of the symbiotic relationship and we pivoted and it allowed us to push our products further and retool our products in a creative way and yet still watch our finances and our expenses. Um, But it was a really interesting way of of, of pivoting um, and not necessarily taking your own funds and keeping to have to throw them into the in, into the company. It was a way to, to give each other something you needed when you were challenged for dollars and finances. But as far as resources for the capital region, I mean, your chambers are fantastic resources, right? I mean, they're doing webinars for you constantly. We recently just did a webinar for a chamber on, on fostering uh, inclusive environments for remote workforce, right? Because managers and individuals in a remote environment that have never been remote don't know how to manage remotely. So, so you know, your chambers could be, there are law firms that are doing fantastic webinars, small business association with SUNY Albany is doing wonderful, um, uh, how to prepare if you're phase one, how to prepare if you're phase two, what's required, and they're all cost free, right? Mm -hmm. So, so for businesses that can't afford a consultant or a large company to come in and help them, these are resources you can use to support you in the capital region. And, you know, and I'd be happy if anybody's interested, I can give you a list of resources that, um, that are available to you. But really, I say to you, partner. Partnerships mm-hmm. are invaluable at a time like this. And also, just to be also clear, just got to the nice it is New York State Industries for, with, for disabilities. Disabilities, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sorry. You know, as far as the resources go to, um, we sh- we've been sharing everything, <clears throat> whether, you know, so John and I share resources. Mm-hmm. I have um, customers calling me up. You were saying how, you know, customer conversations are key. I feel like I'm closer to my customers now than ever. Absolutely. I call them up. How are you doing? Do you need this? Did you see this? Um, and because I'm like you too, Nicole, I have like 50 screens and I'm watching more than mm-hmm. one at a time and my phone. Because sometimes like I want to see something over again, but I don't want to watch the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like people, it's, it's um, I'm a, I could take in a lot of stimulation but I'm using all that information to also help my customers, help my colleagues. People know to come to me if you want to know, you know, what the newest regulation is or mm-hmm. what the governor said. I've got it. So it's kind of a nice thing to be able to, uh, you know, you can't do everything now. Business is different, but still helping someone else has always been part of our business. We donated to thousands of companies in the last ten years just because 
So we donated, you know, copiers to the COVID tents of all the hospitals, or we also gave our customers like 90 day um, deferral on their payments. We're trying to figure out how can we help them. Um, and, you know, you hope that maybe it, it creates a better, you know, better business economy. If everyone's helping each other out, giving each other a little mm -hmm. break, I think it really will serve everyone in the long run too. And it's um, going back to that whole thing about the crises. It, crises brings you together internally as an organization, as a company, but crises also brings you together as a business community because mm -hmm. you all want your region to survive. You all rely on the restaurants. You all rely on the products. You know, when I need a copier, I would go to Dawn or whatever be the case. We're relying, we want each other to succeed because this is our home. These are our people, right? And people are our assets. And we're, as leaders, we want our region. If our region is successful, it'll help us be successful. So, yeah. Well, with, with that in mind, the idea that, that sort of we're all in this together, um, what's the best way for, for business leaders to kind of facilitate this kind of change by uh, essentially inspiring and empowering employees kind of a, across your organization, whether, whether as you say, Sanjata, you have a, a small or, or large business? You, you know, the most important thing right now is communication. I can't tell you. I don't, you know, any organ, we work with organizations that are global organizations with 10,000 employees to organizations that have 32 employees to 15 employees. But it doesn't matter because fear is fear during crises. Right? And, and people are scared for their jobs, their families, the livelihood, their companies, owners, leaders are scared of, for the survival of their organization. So it's really transparent communication. We do this um, uh, information board every morning and we're small, but still every morning, my team knows exactly which clients this, what deliverables are due, which clients are put on pause. What is, what is, our, you know, what is our financial picture look like for the most part? What's our timeline look at which clients are overlapping i mean they get a it's called an information board and every morning they get it so that there's they know exactly where we are where we need to be you know then we also do these things we call team huddles every morning um and it's, it's a set time where everybody comes in and we have this thing where i say all right i want you to tell me what's the you know every morning i want to hear what's your number one challenge today what's your number one success you think you want to achieve and, and also then tell me what you need from me as a leader to make those things happen. And that's not just for you, but also for the organization. So give me one for yourself and give me one for your organization. And then give me what you need for me to do to make you successful in our organization successful. That's, so that's also a form of communication. And it's a time to step back as an organization and as senior managers and go, okay, you know, all right, how do we assess our culture? This is a, an opportunity for a hard reset, right? It's an opportunity to go back and say, who are we leaving out? Are we maximizing the talent that we have in our organizations? Are we using them wisely? Are we overusing certain talent and underusing certain talent? Um, and then also, you know, your employee resource groups or do fun things with your team. You know, yesterday, um, uh, the, the uh, I use, uh, uh, a placement agency and and um, for for hiring when we do hiring for for our teams because we have strategic partners so if we are hiring for our clients or even internally I use certain people that I know can help me find diverse population but um, yesterday they did a cooking class with their entire team virtually they hired a chef who did it and it was just sort of it was team building team bonding the other thing I say you do is also remember professional development and professional growth right now is also critical because somebody in one role may not be feeling as valued and as needed because that role right now is on a pause. So how do you help them pivot and teach them to, to learn another role in your organization? And, and you can do that through mentorship and you can do that virtually. We just work with a large global company to develop a, a, a virtual mentorship program for them. Um, and so, you know, and teaching, those individuals that were fearing that they were going to lose their jobs to pivot to another skill set. And so there are different ways to inspire your organization. But the most important thing is, is, is communication and empathy. Because remember, your employees are now right now at home. They're dealing with childcare issues. They're dealing with possible parents at home, possible parents in nursing homes. They're dealing with, you know, uh, uh, partners may have lost their jobs. Uh, so there's so much going on in their home 
So also have a little bit of flex flexibility. Like um, one of my employees called me on Friday and said, I'm having childcare issues. Um, can I work in the evening? And I said, sure. The bottom line is get it done. Just deliver what we need to deliver. Make sure our clients get what they need to get and, and, and you're responsive. Yeah, go ahead. Change your hours today from this to this. So it's just about being flexible and empathetic and communicating. I think that those are the ways to inspire. I can't emphasize it more. I have to, I just want to add, like I, I wound up actually firing myself from my normal position um, because I do tend to like go in and almost militarily like go and take control and um, step into that because this is my baby. And, you know, it's every, every I have, you know, everyone in the capital region has a personal guarantee on Nicole Snow, I joke about, um, but I kid, I kid, but um I have done a lot of like self-reflection and working with consultants to figure out what my highest and best good is to my company. And what we've uncovered is like, yes, I, I think in as owners, you have to, I think it's an opportunity right now to take inventory of this. It's a very, it's a very interesting time because we're not all trying to completely expand our business in a traditional way. And I I feel very strongly about pumping the brakes and saying, okay, like for me, I realize, you know what, I'm probably the best person to do R and D for products and figure out sourcing stories. Like that's what made my company what it is. And then I think like what happens with a lot of small business owners is that you wind up doing everything else. You do HR, you do CFO. You, and then when you really look, you're like, Whoa, I, this is not my highest and best use for the company in terms of how to provide value. And what I did is I, like I did wind up firing myself from so much of my day to day. And I think I used to grapple with that. I'm like, well, that's just lazy. Like an owner should be in the day to day leading from, mm -hmm. you know, in front and communicating. And I'm actually, I recognize that I too am so freaking stressed and I have like, <laughs> I wear my heart on my sleeve and like, it comes out and I'm like, okay, guys, this is how much cash we have in the bank right now. This is what our sales needs to be. And you need to do that, like figure it out. And I just like, I fired myself and I think being like, okay with that. But then what wound up happening is I've watched, like I have my ops manager, Amanda, who has been with me for a long time. And she's really stepping in as the COO of my company, like right before my eyes, this young woman who's just freaking <clears throat> slaying right now. And I'm watching people who, you know, again, we've had a high degree of attrition, but the people who are stepping up, they're like, okay, like, this is a true opportunity for me. And because I've stepped out of this like high control area and let it go, like I else it and let it go a little bit. I'm watching them grow the company in other ways that like it wasn't right in front of me or it wasn't necessarily like my first, you know, piece of fruit to pick, but they're going for it. They're staying motivated. And I'll say that like I, people do have so many things going on at home. And my one piece of feedback is people have been inspired because they know that they're working every day and they're really contributing to something bigger than themselves. And that's, that's been critical too. So I think the other side is like from the owner founder perspective, we get so damn passionate and that can like wind up having a negative to it and knowing when to just be like, okay, not necessarily the right person for this job, hiring a consultant to maybe help with some of that language. So you have talking points. Um, but that's, that's what we've done and, and how our business is going is, is, really, I don't say pivoting, we're just changing who should be in what seats. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I want to make I want to make sure we have enough um, time to get to um, the audience's questions. And if if you're watching, please do post them on whatever platform you're watching on. But um, Nicole, that's kind of a it's a good segue to the, the last of my questions, which is, uh, you know, this is a stressful time for everyone. But how important is it to maintain standards with employees. You know, you spoke very eloquently about how people are stepping up, but um, what about people who are, who are either not stepping up or who are just not meeting expectations? Mm -hmm. um, it, how important is it to, to make sure that you've got, as you put it earlier, that, that SEAL team working for you? Yeah, I think that um, right now, this might sound harsh, but this is just like, I'm, I'm small business front lines. And I think establishing and maintaining standards that you had before you went from work from home need to stay consistent. Um, I think it's people, I, and this is, this is just coming from my experience of working like with global economies, working with co-ops in India, 
people want to work. People want to give to something else. And I think we've all worked on teams where you have one person who's not really quite doing it, right? And you're like, God, I gotta, I gotta pick their weight up again. In this environment, I have found, and I've had a couple of instances, again, super high attrition at Darn Good Yarn. Um, like we all talk about, like it spreads like cancer and then we do, you know, performance improvement report. And we all, I think anyone here who's had to hire a fire, we've all gone like, okay, maybe we can just mentor them and they'll be mm -hmm. the next. <laughs> the cancer spreads so quickly in this environment mm -hmm. of having crappy attitudes and lackluster, like I'm going to mm -hmm. join part of this team. When you have everyone else, like when you have people that are hyper motivated, like we're going to figure this out. We're all rowing together. I don't know where we're rowing, but we're going to row somewhere. And you have that one person that like, mm, I don't really think so. Or I didn't eat my Wheaties this morning. So I'm not going to work as hard as everyone else. Um, I think that it, 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 it has to be stressed. And like I said before, I'd rather have a SEAL team as we start to figure out what our highest and best uses as a company behind me. And I know we're all thinking about the bottom line. You're all learning about business finance, working with me rather than having a whole army and then trying to mold people. Like I'm not in that place right now. And this really is going to be survival of the fittest. I had another, like just two very quick points. I think it's important for small business owners to be very cautious of vanity KPIs. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is, I think you're going to hear of a lot of people saying, we didn't have to let anyone go during this time. We didn't have to do this. We had a hundred percent this. I think it's, it's difficult, but it's an opportunity for, I'm seeing people step up and go to the other side and mm -hmm. take this very stressful situation and say, you know what, I'm going to make the most out of my career right now. And this is an opportunity. Um, and I think as leaders, you have to be strong enough to not have ego in keeping to these vanity KPIs moving forward. Mm -hmm. I think it's very dangerous. I'm seeing some companies start to do that. And I said, that might not actually be, it may be it is, but it might mm -hmm. not be the best use for your company so that you see to the other side. We don't know how long a recession is going to be. We don't know what capital markets are going to look like for small business. I mean, let's just all look at how the PPP rolled out. We, at SBA guidance on that alone was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm not more gray. Um, and then the other thing too, is I think being very careful of hiring in the future. I think we've, I, I mean, I've even said it with my husband. Um, oh, there's going to be like a flood of really good talent on the market. There's going to be a flood of a lot of, like a lot of, you're going to get everyone in. So I think the hiring practices and the really hiring um, for the company and org behavior um, is going to be critical now more than ever. And I think as small, again, small business, like I'm like, oh, you have a pulse and you want to work for my little company. Awesome. And now like, you can't do that. I mean, especially as I'm seeing all, all the unemployment claims uh, come in from people who work for me for like a week come in and you're like, wow, this is, this is a whole new ball game right now. I had a different experience with my team. Um, we first of all are a sales organization and we were only selling IT services and not our core business. So we did have to change the expectations, but we had to make clear expectations. And I think people do best with clarity. I think it makes people calmer when they understand what the expectations are, but they do for us, they had to be modified. Um, so now we're doing more again, funneling leads to IT um, and, and making sure we're getting the right people. But my team was so grateful to have a job. And I agree with the vanity KPIs because we had just acquired a company like two weeks before this happened. And I was like, oh my God, we're going to be $20 million this year. I'm so excited. I thought it was going to be like the best year of my life in business. And obviously that's completely changed. So I did, did I, I fell for that. I still fall for that. I'm proud that, you know, of who's here. I keep, you know, I, you know, I, I, I feel it. And it is for my own as much as it is for everybody else to some extent, just to feel good about that. But I do have to agree that you have to let that go and do what's right for the people you have. And that's how we've always had to be. We have now 90 people we have responsibility for. It's not about the numbers. It's about what can we do best to keep these guys, you know, safe and happy and hired. But people were so, as I started to say, I had so many emails, like, thank you for, for my job. I know this has been tough. Thanks for talking to me every single day at four. You've, you know, you've kept me happy. You've kept me calm. You've inspired me. And we went through, you know, keeping people calm now to doing fun things once a week and having, you know, a trivia day or whatever. So, you know, we are, as you just like the leading indicators, as you said, we're kind of the leading indicators for our company and how we address the team is going to be how they're going to feel ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, 
but and every company is different. So I completely get that. And I just want to say, Sujat, I did learn a lot from you already today. So thank you. You're welcome. Your great ideas. But Nicole, you know, I have to say, I feel very much like you at, at moments, you know, because literally, I kid you not, we went from uh, a year ago, we had two employees two and we were hustling like you cannot imagine we were working until 10 30 at night waking up at five in the morning i mean we were here i didn't even have an office space until two years ago and then we went from two to four in a year and i thought oh my gosh i just grew more than 100 percent. blah 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 and then all of a sudden this happens and we were and i had i had hired my fourth employee not even thinking i could afford the fourth one i was saying you know it's always like build it and they will come and so I decided, okay, I'm going to build it and they're going to come. Well, I built it and all of a sudden this pandemic occurred, right? And then you're going, oh gosh, now I've got four employees. Am I going to go back to two? Can I, I mean, it was just, it was, it was mayhem, but we use this thing. And, and I have to say, so expectations have to be, first of all, for us are communicated and so that I can keep the four, right? I mean, we, we talk about this all the time. It's like, we're in it together. We're floating together or we're sinking together. So how do we have this, this, so we've created, and it's great, LB came up with it. It's a matrix, right? It's called the urgent, important, not urgent, important, so on and so forth. And we go through this matrix every morning about what is critical for each person that day to do in order to be able to say, tomorrow is gonna be even a little better. What's not important? What are we making? What are we panicking about that we shouldn't be panicking about? Where are we investing our finances? Are we pivoting our products? Are we providing? And I mean, I finally said to my team, you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to help me come up with a new idea to be able to pitch to clients because I do all the business development. But right now I don't have time to pitch and, and produce, right? Because we're in a whole new environment. I'm pitching harder, pitching more because I'm pitching remotely. And so... You know, I mean, for us, it became a situation where it was like, you know, we're surviving. We're in this together, like Unicol, right? It was like, look, you know, I just need to lay it out completely black and white. And I know I, I should be calming you. But in this situation, we need to really have a diehard, hard conversation. And as much as I want to be here and say, yeah, 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 and be your cheerleader and say to you, everything's going to be blue skies. It's not. So how are we going to make it blue together? And so that that's worked for us, but you know, I mean, we're so small that we can have that conversation. But like I said, you know, there are organizations at every spectrum in our region. But again, transparency and communication is key. I don't care what size you are. Yeah, and well, we tell them the same thing. We just tell everyone every day that we're selling and doing what's right for our customers. You're helping the rest of the company. Mm -hmm. So I think just the same as all of you. It is. I may present it a little differently than that, but it's the same message. You know, we are in this together and you're, whatever you're doing every day is going to dictate our future. So with that, um, that's all That's all I got. Thanks very much to, to the panelists. Um, Dan, I'll hand things off to you. Do we have a couple of questions from the audience? We've got a couple of minutes left. We do, but before we go to questions, let me just say to our three executives on our panel today, if any of the three of you ever contemplate a career change, I'd like to be your first phone call. Okay, here's our questions. In case this um, thing doesn't work out. <laughs> you, you know where to find us. <laughs> so here's our first question, uh, and it's to any one of the three of you. Um, if you knew then, that is before the panic hit, what you know now, what is the one thing you might do differently? I mean, for me, I would have um, beefed up our IT group much more quickly. I've been talking about it, but it's hard. You know, we've, we've had this IT division for 10 years and I love it, but some of the other partners like just love the copier business. So I'm always trying to say, we need to hire more for IT. We have, we have a customer waiting list. Like that's not okay. We got to get these people taken care of. I definitely would have um, ramped that up quicker. Now I can tell everybody I told you so, which feels really good. I'm <laughs> not constructive, but it feels good. I would have continued um, again, like I think our timing of our valuation was interesting. Again, working with the CFO and saying, you know, we're looking to make efficiencies and not necessarily, you know, some growth, but not at like the pace that we've been going at for the past few years. Um, and we were already on that track. And there have been so many conversations where I go like, thank God we've been starting to trim that. Like we're talking serious reductions to margin and, um, 
and that's been well incre it increases and we're increasing our profitability and that's that's cr that's critical because you you won't make it up in sales and it's it, when you actually it's interesting if you're really looking and paying attention to what's going in and out on your Amex or what, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and you're saying, how does this really, what does this really mean for bills and get back into that really scrappy place of entrepreneurship? I think where a lot of us started, I started my company out of my savings account. Like I'm not, I own my company. <laughs> so yeah. um, no, like outside investors. And so I getting back into that scrappy place, it's kind of like invigorating. And I wish I would have done even more of that. I just got very busy with, you know, life and, that whole thing. Yeah. And for There's, me, I think the biggest thing would have been vulnerability, right? Um, I was so afraid to share my uh, failures and my fears with my peers or even my clients sometimes that I think now it's almost like you can, I wish I had done it before where I picked up my uh, the phone and say to my client, listen, I'm having this challenge with your product or what we're trying to deliver for you. You know, what is it we could do together to pivot? Right? Or what is it together we could do to make it such the deliverable is on time or better for you? Or, or And I never, ever did that. I never used my, I always felt like I had to be this perfect uh, partner, perfect consultant. And I think now it's just like, yeah, you almost have to be raw and vulnerable to succeed. Because I think that if people realize that we're all in this together, right? And we're all in this survival mechanism together that if we lean in and say, hey, I am having this issue that we're going to and I never did before and now I do. And I think it's, mm -hmm. I've learned from it and they've learned from me that they can say things to me too about their companies um, that they were not willing to share before. Authenticity is a currency right now. <laughs> it is, it really, really is. We have, uh, there's another question I'd like to ask, recognize we only have about two minutes to answer it. And uh, Dawn, this might be a good one for you. When you evaluate your employees, do you look at any tangible paper trail results or is it more important that they stay mentally engaged in the business, i.e. maintain commitment to stay as a valued employee? Is if at that question is for now currently versus what it was right. before. I think that, as I was saying, we're so much closer now that um, it, it, the engagement is everything because we aren't going to see the paper results that we saw. So it's partly engagement, but it's also partly what can, how can you help us fix something differently? So somebody might be doing marketing when they weren't before. Somebody might be really good at presentations, so they're cleaning up our PowerPoint. So we can't really measure it on paper the same way that we used to, but everybody has other talents and skills and that's what we started with. Everybody give me an idea of what we can do better, how you can help, what ideas can we use? So I'm learning about everybody in different ways than I've ever learned before. And um, so, so the answer is no, the paper trail um, to me right now is less important. The numbers of what they're producing is less important, but the, the point is it will be important again. So we can't completely lose sight of it because that's really um, going to be everything going forward at, at some point. But this, I think we're always going to take a little bit of what we learned during this time or a lot. Like I'm running my company so much more efficiently, like you're saying, Nicole, this forces you to be, be to be at your best. You can't, we used to, we donated, you know, to 200 companies and I love doing that, but we may have to cut back a little bit or we're the first place to say, you know, give somebody a raise because they had a financial hardship. You know, we may have to maybe be a little more careful and we may have to cut, you know, things that we didn't want to cut in the past. So yeah, we're learning how to run the company better, but we're also learning how to, you know, manage better, be clear in expectations, but we'll have to still have some of the stuff that worked for us in the past and kind of add that back in when the time comes. And it also well, gives you an opportunity for the paper trail, right? Like you recognize, like, was I overusing my time tracking people and the paper trail uh, mm -hmm. when it wasn't even necessary now? You step back and you go, maybe that was an inefficient process anyways, or a KPI that shouldn't have even been part of their performance evaluation. So I think it also gives you an opportunity and any, all of us in business, an opportunity to step back and look at our performance evaluations and our paper trails in an efficiency standpoint too. So. Good. Well, we're, we're running out of time. So, so let me wrap it up and let me thank our panelists today. Uh, it was a really robust discussion. We covered a lot of ground. Um, your passion, the passion that each one of you has for your companies is evident. Uh, and your storytelling uh, and your willingness to share some of your own anxieties and challenges is very much appreciated. I can tell from comments that are coming in 
Uh, a lot of our folks have learned a lot from the three of you today, and we really appreciate it. So thank you for your time and sharing your thoughts and your wisdom. Thanks also to the Times Union, who is our partner in these sessions. I said up front when we started our first session that this is an experiment. It was not an opportunity to provide a lot of answers to every challenge. It was an opportunity to stimulate a discussion in our business community about some of the challenges we anticipate and to talk about some of the solutions that we might see. And I think we've accomplished that. But what I don't know is whether we're finished. Um, I know that as uh, the economy restarts, as we all restart our businesses or change our businesses, there will be new challenges, different challenges. And so uh, stay tuned. Uh, we may be back with some other sessions in the future and we'd love your help. If you feel that there are things we haven't covered, if you feel that as the days move on and, uh, and we learn different things about the economy, new things, um, send us ideas. Uh, we're, uh, we're very interested in keeping these discussions going if you all feel that there's a value in them. So stay tuned, we may be back. Again, thanks to our panelists today. Thanks to all of the panelists for all four sessions. We hope all of you who've joined us today have learned something. We appreciate your support and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you and hang in there, Capital Region. <laughs>